We are almost through our study in the book of Job. And um, I was thinking about that this week, about God and how he kind of designed all things, of course, and, and obviously studying this section of, of, the, of the book. And I was looking at my own childhood and my own adolescence, and I was thinking about, like, hey, I can look back and say, you know what, I can now see as an adult, and I'm sure most of us in this room can kind of see this, I can now go back and, and really, really understand why my parents did some of the things they did why they raised us the way they did, why they, they did certain things or, or made us do certain things. Here's an example. My brother and I were, uh, were latchkey kids, right? So my parents, they both worked. And after school, particularly when we were a little bit older, we, we had a key and we walked home together and we had to get home. And one of the things that we were required to do when we got home was to either call my dad with a special ring code or page him. Youngsters, I'll explain paging at some other point. <laughs> So we had to do those things in order to let them know we were home safely. Because you know what they didn't have back in those days? They didn't have the ring cameras. You know, they didn't have the doorbell camera. They didn't have that find your phone app on their phones. And I can only imagine, now, again, now that I'm a parent and I have children, how difficult it probably was for them to not really have any way to reach us, aside from the landline phones, and to know if we were actually home or not. And I can think about it even now, if, if Gabrielle's bus is like a minute or two late, like we go in panic mode. Like, where's my kid? Where is my child? Where is this person? If Elizabeth's out with her friends, even people that we trust, I'm turning on that where's my kid app, I mean, where's my phone app, to find out where she is, if, you know, if she's on her way home or if she's where she's supposed to be. And again, I can go back and look like, well, you know what, my parents weren't overly protective. My parents weren't overly strict. They were doing what I, frankly, what we do nowadays. And I was kind of looking at that this, this week, and I was thinking about it. It's really true for us today also. As Christians, if you're a follower of Jesus, one of the things that we do quite often is we question God about things that are going on in our lives. God, why did this happen? God, why, why is this happening in our lives? Sometimes we wonder even, what are you even doing? What are you up to? And if you're sitting here today and you haven't had those thoughts, my mind is blown. Because I am certain that each and every one of us have had those thoughts before. And what, he's, what we, we realize is when we truly encounter God, that is when we can kind of hopefully step back and realize that he's still completely in control of all things. And that's really at that point when he's revealed to us and when we have that true encounter is when we can really begin to know him and to understand a little bit more of what he's doing in our lives. So hopefully we'll see that. We're going to pull it out in our text today. Job's going to find out what it means to know God. And I'm hopeful that we will as well as we read the text. So again, we're going to be in chapters 38, verse 1, through 42, verse 6. Now, that's a long section of Scripture, and if you haven't been with us before in this, uh, in this, uh, this series, we're, we're kind of looking at it from an overview standpoint and trying to pull out principles that will be useful for us. Uh, so obviously, we're not going to go verse by verse, otherwise you'd be here through lunchtime. And uh, what we're going to see in this passage, which is really neat, is we're going to hear God speak for the first time since chapter 2. So it's been a long time where God has been effectively quiet in this entire section of Scripture. And, and if you look back, and you, if you're familiar with the book of Job, Job goes through and he speaks a lot. And a lot of what he's doing is he's asking and begging and almost demanding God, speak to me and give me answers for what's happening. He's almost making demands of God. And that's why we'll see when God does finally respond, it's, it's not exactly what Job hopes for. It's a little bit different than what Job was really hoping for. At least at first, we'll kind of see how he starts to understand that a little bit. But instead, what we get from God in this response, it's actually a long line of questioning. I want you to imagine that for a moment. How, how difficult do you think that would be for Job to be sitting there just getting questioned by God? That's, that's, a, that's a little bit uh, difficult. But he's, he's asking these series of mostly rhetorical questions. And it only gives Job a few opportunities to respond. One of my favorite writers and, and Bible teachers is Warren Wiersbe. He summed it up like this. He said, that the whole purpose of this interrogation was to make Job realize his own inadequacy and inability to meet God as an equal and defend his cause. 
And then when you look at Job's situation, when you read through his, his, his questioning, that's exactly what he was trying to do. He's trying to make himself equal with God, and, 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 and Wiersbe helps us to see that. Wiersbe continues, and he says that the answer to Job's problems was not an explanation about God, such as the three friends of, and Elihu had given, but a revelation of God. So now we're starting to see a little bit more of what God's purpose is, not only in his response that he'll give shortly, but also in the entire lesson that Job is facing. And I think that's really the lesson that we can learn from this entire section, namely that we must encounter God under his terms, not our own terms. So that's going to be our main idea. We'll focus around that. Our main idea for our text today is this. When I'm suffering, I can seek to know God by encountering him personally. When I'm suffering, I can seek to understand God and know God by encountering him personally. And of course, like like I stated, we can't go through all of the sections, so we're going to just start with the the introduction or uh, piece. So I'm going to just read from chapter 38, verses 1 through 3 to start. It'll be on your screen behind you, behind me. Verse 1, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge, Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. God went straight to the point, didn't he? The Living Bible paraphrases verse 2. He says, why are you using your ignorance to deny my providence? I think that's a good paraphrase. So effectively, Lord, he didn't question Job's integrity. He didn't question his sincerity. He only questioned Job's ability to explain the ways of God in this world. One thing that we'll see, uh, particularly towards the end of our passage today when we get into chapter 42, is that Job thought he knew about God. But what he didn't realize is what he did not know about God. And I think a lot of us can relate to that as well. So the Lord seeks this, uh, he asks this series of questions that takes us all the way through this entire section. Uh, And here's an outline that could be pretty useful for us. He's effectively asking these three questions, and there's a tiny little piece in there that where Job is actually responding. The first section is really chapter 38, can you explain my creation, is effectively the question he's asking Job, and, and various examples. And then chapter 38, 39 through 39, 30, uh, can you oversee my creation? And then Job responds uh, for the first time in, in, in chapter 40, verses 1 through 5. And then the third area there is, can you subdue my creation? And that's 40, verse 6 through 41, verse 34. And then Job responds second time in chapter 42 in those first six verses. So here's a few things. I'm looking through this whole thing, and I'm reading about it this week. It's like, okay, a lot of stuff going on here. God's talking a lot. So what's the whole point of it, right? What is the point of all of this? What is God talking about? And it's listed there, so you don't have anything to fill out just yet. It's listed there in your outlines. But there's a few things that I think we we can see from this that will help us. First thing is we see that the Lord speaks. That's huge, right? That's huge. The Lord here speaks. And we see that really uh, in chapter 38, verse 1, which we read just a moment ago. And I love how this section opened. It said he spoke out of a whirlwind. If you recall, in the previous section, Elihu was speaking about this storm that apparently was happening around him. And he was speaking from this, this storm point of view. Uh, he was uh, apparently the first weatherman. But the Lord speaks here. And it's really neat, though, because the Lord speaks in this manner several times in Scripture. In 2 Kings 2, he brought Elijah into, the, into heaven by a whirlwind. So he chooses this sometimes to reveal himself. Psalm 77 and Nahum chapter 1, the Scriptures confirm that God's presence is often shown in the whirlwind. And then God's coming will be like a whirlwind. And this is in in various scriptures. Isaiah 66 speaks about it, Jeremiah 4 and Jeremiah 23. So God uses this whirlwind to reveal himself to his creation sometimes. Now, of course, all these questions that we see from God, again, most of them are rhetorical. And frankly, most of them are unanswerable by Job. Job can't answer these questions. But the purpose was to show Job that he was in no place to question God. That was the lesson of Job. What's the lesson for us? We're in no place to question God. Right? It's the same lesson for us as well. But there's also a few other things that we can see. One, we can see that God is and always has been present during times of suffering. So even though 
God was quiet during this entire period up until this point doesn't mean he wasn't present. And he, can, he shows that here. And there's also a very important lesson in God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty is, is huge here. Last week I quoted Romans 8.28. This week, let's take a look at the second verse of that section, chapter 8, verse 29. Paul says these words. He says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. What does that tell us? That the purpose is to draw us to his Son. That's always going to be the purpose, is to draw us to his Son, His Son who provides salvation for those who seek Him. The next point we see here is that the wisdom of God is found in His creation. And you see this all throughout chapters 38 and 39. And it's a pretty interesting way He goes through. He kind of systematically progresses through this. And one of the things we see often in there, one of the themes in those two chapters is this idea of wisdom. And wisdom is is a very common theme throughout the entire Scriptures. And notably in the book of Proverbs, when you go into the book of Proverbs, you'll see that it's there, especially towards those first 12 or so chapters. Chapter uh, 9, for example, says this, says it, For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So that wisdom helps us to understand it. It gives us knowledge. And that word knowledge and and understanding and knowing, all those little phrases there, they actually appear over 20 times in this passage in those two chapters. So there's there's a lot of of that there. And I think the first question of his interrogation, for example, comes in in verses 4 and 5. Here's what the Lord says there. He says, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. These verses imply that understanding and knowledge and wisdom are able to be had. We can have those things, but the important thing is the source of that. What is the source of wisdom? What is the source of understanding? In effect, what God's saying here is is he's reminding us that it's not the the why that's important, but the who. It's not as much as the why other than the who. The who is, is what's important. And I love what Paul tells us in chapter 9 of his book to the Romans, his letter to the Romans. He helps us to remember that questioning God is not a great idea, and it's just illogical if you think about it. He says this in in chapter 9, verse 20, But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? What will his molded say to his molder? Why have you made me like this? No bull has ever asked him, like, why am I a bull? Why am I a bull? And this begins, this understanding, this questioning, it begins... And this wisdom begins with what? The fear, the fear of God. It begins with having that reverent fear of God. And it means that we should be more focused on what God desires for us during these situations, during these struggles, during these areas, rather than questioning God in those areas and during those times. And it's not an easy thing to do. The next point of this passage is related, and it speaks to the power of God is indicated in his mighty creatures. You know I couldn't get through this sermon without talking about the behemoth and the Leviathan. Very interesting section of scripture that covers a long part of what God is speaking about here. And it, it, there is an interesting points here, I think. And he's speaking about these two powerful, powerful beings. So we, I think we need to ask why. Why is he speaking about these things? Part of me, I was thinking, I was like, wait a minute, are we just going against everything I just talked about when I say why? We're going to question God. Why did you put these in here? Maybe. But we're going to talk about it anyway. We don't know exactly what these creatures are. They're not creatures that we have and we're familiar with now. The behemoth is generally categorized as a large, large land animal. The leviathan is usually categorized as a mythical sea creature of some sort. Some commentators actually say that the behemoth is actually a hippo and that the leviathan is actually a crocodile. But you and I both know that's not as cool as a sea monster or a giant land animal. <laughs> Just saying. So, but the best explanation I've seen to, uh, to kind of explain these, these two examples and why they're being used comes from David Guzik. He says it this way. He says, a logical point is made if Job cannot contend with leviathan or the behemoth, or even Satan, whom Leviathan represents, how could he ever hope to stand against God who made and masters Leviathan? 
This was another effective way of setting Job in his proper place before God. So that's why he brings these two animals out and says, look, can you, can you even touch these two animals? Would you even dare to stand up against these two animals that I have created? They will follow what I have to say, but there's no way you could even contend. And I saw this video, and it kind of reminded me of this. There's this video that surfaced fairly recently of a, of a 60-year-old orca whale, also known as a killer whale. And this, this orca whale charged and attacked a great white shark. And if I'm mis not mistaken, killed him. And it was, a, it was a remarkable thing. And one of the remarkable things that experts were talking about is the fact that, that most killer whales, they, they actually they hunt in packs. So the fact that this 60-year-old killer whale went after this great white shark on her own was amazing as it is. And then, of course, the fact that we were able to see it and experience that was pretty neat. But I don't know about you, but when I think about killer whales, I don't always look at them as hunters. You know, I'm thinking about Shamu and Free Willy. Right? That's what I'm thinking about. But they are actually killer whales. Orca, I, I just recently learned, means killer. So they, they are killers. They're hunters. But they just look like these big, lovable whales. But imagine being that powerful and that big and that large enough where you can go take down great white shark. The, the, the same great white shark that they made jaws about. This, this thing was able to take this thing down. So that's really what God's talking about here. He's saying, look, these two beasts, no man can handle them. No man can stand up against them. And you think you can come and talk to me, Job? That's effectively what God's saying there. And the next point here is this, that God alone can vindicate Job. God alone vindicates Job. God issues a challenge. That's what he's doing here. He's issuing a challenge to Job. And this challenge starts here, uh, and it follows Job's first response in chapter 40, verses five and 4 and 5. Job states this. He says, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer. Twice, but I will proceed no further. Job finally says, I, I can't. There's nothing I can say to this, God. There's nothing I can say here. And this is how God responds. Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Would you condemn me that you may be in the right? Have you, ha have you an arm like God and can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe, the clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and abase him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them all in the dust together. Bind their faces in the world below. And I, then I will also acknowledge to you that your own right can save you. So this section here, he, he, he's, he's kind of winding down his response to Job. He's starting to wind down his response. And he's setting out again to remind him that the living God is one who's not so much to be debated, but encountered. Not as much to being debated as encountered. Not to be discussed, but to be known. That's the reminder that we have when we look at this big picture. And that's why we said earlier that when we're suffering, I can seek to know God by encountering him personally. If you think about this whole interaction, this is a personal encounter from Job that he had with God. It's a personal encounter with him. So I want to close with Job's response, but I want to also look at some lessons and actions that we can take that's going to help us pull from this, this passage as well. First thing we see here is that I ought to believe in the sovereignty of God. To believe in the sovereignty of God. That's really what the Lord's leading up to in this entire passage. And I want you to notice there was a contrast to last week. If you weren't here last week, if you haven't heard it, you can jump on our YouTube channel and check it out there. But last week I, I spoke about acknowledging God as the sovereign. Here we're talking about believing God as sovereign and in his sovereignty, right? So there's now that head knowledge now turns into a heart knowledge. And there's an application that we need to take from our hearts to, to actually believe, believing that with our heart. And this helps us to surrender all things to him. Helps us to surrender all these things to him when we have that understanding internally and when he speaks to us personally. So if you're struggling with that, 
pray that he gives you that, that conviction to surrender and to understand his sovereignty in all things. Next thing we see here is that we need to believe that everything that God does is right and good. Everything he does is right and good. And again, this is an application of the heart. Believing with our hearts that God is just, that God is fair, that God is going to do exactly what he's designed to do. He is righteous and he knows what's best for us. And if you look at his response, that's kind of what we see there, because God still doesn't answer Job's questions, does he? He still doesn't tell Job why he was going through these things. He's saying, instead, look at me. Seek me. I am still in charge, Job. That's what he's trying to tell him here. So we need that assurance sometimes, don't we? I think we do. We need that assurance, so pray for that assurance. And then next, repent of all the times I've questioned or blamed God. Now we're getting personal. This is a little bit more difficult. Now we've got to look back and reflect in our own lives. And that's what makes it personal. The Lord's questioning of Job, he's effectively saying, it's like, Job, I'm going to give you a bunch of questions, and if you can answer them, then you have the right to speak up against me. But if you cannot, zip it. That's the Ryan paraphrase, by the way. All these details that God speaks here, it's, it's really remarkable. He talks, starting with the foundations of the earth, the controls of the sun and the moon and the stars, the flight patterns of the hawk. God gives you so much detail of all the things he's in charge of and all the things he has power over, all to show us his power and control. All of that to show his power and control. So he concludes that, that when you can control all things, always... This is God to Job. When you can control all things always, then you can question me. Because we'll be at the same level. But because you're not, seek me instead. Trust that he knows. Trust that God knows what he's doing. So let's pray for God to humble us. To to be in that level where we can approach God in that way. And then finally here we see that we need to be satisfied with the will of God. That's another hard one. Because that means we might sometimes have to, to accept the bad that comes with life. And this is definitely one of the hardest lessons for us. Because sometimes his will is not our will. His will is not always our will. Sometimes we pray for healing and we don't get healed. Sometimes we pray for, for life and we don't see it come through. Sometimes we pray for relief and we don't get that. But the satisfaction, the joy comes from knowing and believing that God has a purpose through these things. And one thing that we can do is trust that God's going to provide for us and provide for our needs. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 6. He talks about this idea and understanding of being anxious and he warns against it. He says this in, in verses 28 and 29. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they are grown They neither toil or spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. I love that that passage from him, that quote from him. Think about the lilies of the field are beautiful and they're, they're, they're clothed with beauty. And he's like, Solomon in all his possessions is not even close to that. And I think there's a part of me that's, that believes that when, when God speaks about all of these things in these couple of chapters, he's really helping us in illustrating that point. He says, if I provide for all of these things, the hawk and the foundations and everything else, don't you think I'm going to provide for you, my beloved, most treasured creation? Think about it. Adam, first man, was created in God's image. He treasures, that's his most treasured possession, his most treasured uh, creation. He, he appointed Adam to have dominion over all creatures and the land. And even when, when he was alone, and he says, we need to, you know, I, I don't like that my, my, my friend Adam was alone. He says, I need to find something suitable. And we read that there was no suitable partner for him. There was nobody equal to him until he created Eve. God cares enough about us personally to ensure that we have what we need. So as we close, I want to look at Job's response. And that's in chapter 42, verses 1 through 6. 
Beautiful response from Job. He says this, starting at verse 1. Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you, and therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job basically said, you're right. And I know, at least for me, saying you're right sometimes is very, very hard. We don't like to admit when we're wrong. That's where our pride kind of comes in, doesn't it? So how do we respond to a personal encounter with God? That's the final area I want to discuss this morning. Don't worry, it'll be quick. We've talked about it a lot, so we'll be kind of going through this fairly quickly. First thing is confess that God is sovereign. We have to confess that God is sovereign. Our belief leads to confession. And that's what Job says here when he says, I know And that knowledge is much different than the knowledge he believed he had back in chapter 3, isn't it? This knowledge now is coming from a humbled and broken man. A place where each and every one of us need to be to encounter God. When we're humbled and broken, that is when we understand our need for a Savior. That is where we find our understanding that we need a Savior. And then we confess with our mouths that He is Lord. And the Bible says... We are saved. Next, we need to be humble and repent. We need to be humble and repent. Job finally had to come to that understanding that he did not know God as he he thought he did. And there's many people that we're going to encounter in our lives that they think they know God, but they really don't. You got to understand that to know God is to trust God. Humility, if you think about it, is one of the largest pieces to repentance. Because that means we have to admit that we're wrong and that we have to admit that we wronged God. Without it, we don't realize that we need. Without humility, we don't realize that we need to repent. But this encounter, this personal encounter with God will lead you to repentance. One of the authors I've been reading for this sermon series said it this way. He says, those who do not, or I'm sorry, those who do know God come in time to recognize that it is better to know God and to trust God than to claim the rights of God. And that was Job's folly as he claimed to know the rights as, 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 of course, along with his buddies. And then finally he says this, Job reminds us to submit to God. We are to submit to God. And I think verse 5 is, is, is where we see some of the most important words of Job. He says, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. There was a difference there. He, in other words, I thought I knew you, but now I know you. Now I know you. Now I've encountered you personally, and I know you. I thought I knew you, but I didn't. That's a huge step in a believer's life. You see, Job came to know God through a personal encounter. Personal encounter with Jesus. Personal encounter with God. But he had to listen first. He had to hear God speak first. That led to his confession. That led to his repentance. And that led to his submission. My question to you, and I think most of you in this room have, have you had that personal encounter with God? Have you had that personal encounter with him? And I think oftentimes we question why God's doing things in our lives, why things are happening the way they are, instead of just seeking Him and trusting Him and understanding that He's sovereign and He's still in charge of all these things. As hard as it is, as difficult as it goes through, and sometimes we don't even understand why it's happening, but we have to understand that He's doing it for a purpose. So will you trust Him today? If you haven't done that already, have you and will you do that today? Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are good. And sometimes, Lord, it is very hard to understand what's going on and why things are happening the way they are. But I pray, God, that in those situations, in those circumstances, that we can just humble ourselves and trust that you are at work and know that you're at work 
and trust that you have our best interest in mind and trust that you're going to get us to the end, whatever that end might be. And I know it's difficult. And I know we all struggle with it. So I pray, God, that you help us to see that anytime something comes up that's not within our plan, let us remember and understand that it is your, part of your plan. Help us to remember that you are in charge of all things, that you know all things, and that you are still present even when we don't see you or hear you. Help us to seek you in those times. Not to run away from you, but to seek you during those times. Help us to do that, God, because that's what we need in our lives. That's the hope that we have is to know that you're still working in us so we can be united with you one day along with all of our loved ones and all of those that you have called. So help us to do that, God, because without it, we're hopeless. Without it, we're, we're lost. So help us to do that each and every day, but particularly in those times where we feel lost or, or defeated. Help us to remember that we have victory because of your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.